Welcome to the PH Initiative Podcast. In this podcast, we will be examining the importance of formal risk calculation in patients with functional class 2 pulmonary arterial hypertension. This podcast is a disease education program sponsored by, and the presenters are being compensated by, United Therapeutics. No product information will be discussed in this podcast. Good day. My name is Dr. Raymond Benza. I am a cardiologist and the division director for cardiovascular medicine at The Ohio State University here in Columbus, Ohio. Have a long experience in treating patients with PAH and are considered an expert in formalized risk assessment. I've conducted many clinical trials in this disease over my 25 year history and have my own vascular biology lab that is funded through the NIH for understanding the genetic underpinnings of this disease and to continue to further improve the tools that we have to risk stratify patients with this disease. I'm happy to have today as my guest, Dr. Sandeep Sahai. Dr. Sahai, thanks so much for being here and I'm gonna have you do the honor of introducing yourself. Thank you, Dr. Benza, and I'm so excited to be here with you. I am Dr. Sandeep Sahai. I'm a pulmonologist at Houston Methodist Lung Center, Houston Methodist Hospital, Houston, Texas. And uh, my clinical work is primarily focused on patients with pulmonary hypertension and uh, other pulmonary vascular diseases. I'm actively involved in clinical trials and clinical studies. I have my personal interest in protopulmonary hypertension, and I am trying to look for genetic basis uh, of this disease. I'm excited here to be with Dr. Benza, and I will be discussing about uh, one of our recent publication about the physician gestalt and risk stratification. Well, thanks very much. Dr. Sahai was the lead author on an important study, as he just mentioned, of risk assessment in patients with functional 2 pulmonary arterial hypertension. This study evaluated physician gestalt and formal risk calculation in functional class 2 patients and assessed the factors that could explain any discordance between the two. This article can be downloaded at phinitiative.com. Dr. Sahai and I are excited to share this study with you, so why don't we get started? So, Sandeep, first question for you. According to the treatment guidelines, risk assessment is critical in the management of all our patients with PAH, driving both our initial choices and continued treatment escalation. Tell us a little bit about the conceptualization of this study with functional two patients. Thanks, Dr. Benza. This question is actually a very important question because when we treat and manage patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, there is a general perception among the clinicians taking care of these patients that function class two patients are sort of doing well, they are stable. And I think this study very much questions that stability which is exactly what we highlighted in this study, that even though these patients are functional class 2, they can be in intermediate to high risk and at somewhat higher level for disease progression and subsequently at higher risk for mortality as well. What we showed in this study that as per our perception, the patients who were thought to be in function class 2, they were actually at much more higher risk by showing that when we apply the risk stratification scores, they were in intermediate to high risk or a high risk category. Well, that's really interesting. You know, we've used functional class for so long, and I've often come to question its subjective nature. And so formal risk assessment really takes a lot of that subjectivity out of the equation when you use that. And in essence, it really complements and makes the single set appointment of functional class much more comprehensive, I think. Well, let's examine the study design. Dr. Sahai, can you describe the physicians who participated in this study? So we included a variety of physicians and also a variety of settings. So we had physicians who were pulmonologists and cardiologists. We included 38 pulmonologists and cardiologists in the United States. They did have a pretty good experience in managing pH patients on, an, uh, on, an, on a median of like 60 patients per year. 
And they were from diverse settings. There were many from academic settings. There were from private, tertiary level, and pH comprehensive care centers. And we did analyze 153 patient charts for this analysis. As far as their baseline therapies were concerned, just keep it in mind that in this study, we included only functional class 2 patients. 38% of patients were receiving monotherapy and 62% of patients were on combination with PDE5 and endothelial receptor antagonist combination. We did exclude the patients who were on prostacycline class therapy actively or within the last three months. We did acknowledge uh, some study limitations in our paper that obviously we were limited by the physician participation and patient chart review. So we had a relatively small sample size for this study. Thanks for that great summary. So in this study, we looked at physician gestalt and formal risk calculations. How were these obtained? For physician gestalt, physicians were interviewed and they were asked to provide their own risk assessment for each patient using their best clinical judgment. However, we aren't sure if physicians were using any sort of risk stratification To do the formal risk calculation, we used three different risk calculation methods, modified non-invasive version of French, Compara, and a Reveal 2.0, which included 13 parameters, including renal insufficiency and recent hospitalization. Again, the study limitations were because of the missing data. It was a retrospective study. We were not able to obtain all the parameters needed for each patient to calculate those risks. Okay, thanks for that. Well, let's get to the results of the study. When risk was formally calculated, more than half of the functional two patients in the study were shown to be intermediate or high risk. For example, using the French non-invasive method, 79% of the functional two patients were classified as intermediate or high risk. Is this consistent with what you see in your practice? Yes, this was a very exciting observation. And I think this finding is very much consistent. And as I recently started using in the last one year, we have been using Reveal 2.0 in our clinical practice. And I also noticed that almost 30 to 40 percent of my patients who I assumed or I would say in my physician just start as low risk or doing well were actually not low risk. So I am very much convinced with this finding that this is likely true. Yeah, we've seen something very similar in my practice and amongst my partners that functional class tends to underestimate the comprehensive risk of a patient by about 30 to 40 percent. That's pretty interesting. Well, let's let's go on. When we looked at the congruence between clinical gestalt and formal risk calculation in these functional two patients, it ranged from 43 to 54 percent depending on the tool used. If we look at the patients assumed to be low risk by gestalt, 64% of these were reassigned to a worse risk category after formal calculation using the French non-invasive method. Among these patients considered to be low risk by gestalt, 4 to 28% were categorized as high risk using formal risk calculation. That's really amazing. What are the implications of under-assessing risk on these patients' lives and long-term prognoses? Well, I think one of the most important implication of this finding is if we are underestimating the risk for disease progression, that means we are under-treating our patients. As a result, we are increasing their risk for poor outcomes. Now, data have again and again shown that the patients treated with more treatment will have better outcomes. Not achieving a low risk status means you are heading for a worse prognosis. Very interesting. So underestimating risk leads to undertreatment of patients. We're going to dig into that a little bit later in this conversation, but let's go on a little bit more here. What do you think the reasons for this incongruence was based on your analyses? This was one of the very interesting findings we observed in this analysis that the physicians who were doing echocardiography less frequently were more incongruent with the risk stratification or formal risk assessment. I think one of the bases for this observation is that the echocardiography can pick up 
the progression or the change is much earlier than when the patients can report those symptoms to their physicians or changes in their functional class or changes in their six-minute walk distance. So I think this was a very important observation of the study that if you do echocardiography more frequently, you are less incongruent with the formal risk stratification-based risk assessment of your patient. And I think this highlights another important fact that you should not just be looking at functional class to assess the risk. So it's a very comprehensive, multi-parametric assessment for these patients. And another important factor here is that physician reported patient activity level. Patients with moderate or high activity levels are more likely to have incongruent risk assessment. And also physician reported patient symptomatic stability and improvement over time. A uh, patient may change the activities they perform to activities that are easier for them to accomplish, thus leading to a potential misassessment of function class. That's really interesting. And that's why formal risk assessment is really so important. And I think these data underscore the importance of frequent echocardiograms and risk assessment. How frequently are you performing echoes on your patients with pH and does it differ based on patient status? depending on where they fall or what is going on, if I'm changing therapies, titrating prostacycline, and all those factors play a role. But if someone who is on for routine follow-up, generally in our clinic, we follow them around three to four months. And at the same time, we do a full reassessment of their risk status with all the testing, which does include echocardiography. But At times, if you have a sicker patient, it's much sooner. Sometimes you have a very low-risk patient. We may prolong that to up to six months also. But generally, I would say most of the patients fall between three to six months period. Yeah, it's a really important point that you brought up, that echocardiography is so sensitive and that these changes in heart structure and function really precede the changes that we see in functional class or even things like our six-minute walk test, like you said. Thanks for that information. Well, what do you think these results say about how we should be monitoring and treating our patients with PAH? In these results, clearly uh, one thing Um, is highlighted that we should be performing a comprehensive risk assessment at each evaluation. Certainly, more frequent echocardiography showed more congruencies with the risk assessment, formal risk assessment of your patient. So clearly, our findings showed that formal risk assessment for pH patient should be done or must be done at each interval when we reassess our patients. So functional class seems to underestimate risk when using formal risk stratification. And symptoms are one of the last signs of disease progression. So we need to be really proactive in how we are monitoring and treating our patients with formal risk calculations and doing them every six months in according with treatment guidelines. And again, stability is not good enough for functional class two patients. We really should be treating to low risk status. And if you wait for these symptoms to worsen, you're already behind. Those are all great points. What would you like for pH treating physicians to take away from this study? So there are a few things I would like to highlight from the study. The number one is, like you mentioned, that I think function class two is not the only way to really assess the risk of your patient. A comprehensive risk assessment with a formal risk calculation score is very much important and recommended by the guidelines as well. So please do not shortchange their chance to improve. And according to the guidelines, like ESC, ERS guidelines that even at the time of diagnosis and also at follow-up, we should perform a formal risk assessment and we should not just focus on the functional class as the determinant for their risk. Patients at intermediate or high risk should be considered for treatment escalation, including those at functional class two. And watch for your own potential biases when evaluating function class two patients. Patients perceived as having symptomatic stability 
or higher activity levels can throw off gestalt-based assessment of risk. More frequent echoes may help you identify risk change status more consistently, maybe a little bit earlier than the clinical presentation from patients. But overall, these results highlight the importance of formal risk assessment for all patients, particularly when they are function class 2 uh, versus a physician-based gestalt assessment. Those points really resonate with me, uh, Sandeep. And, and one of the things I really like what you said was don't shortchange your patient's chance to improve. I think that's a really important sentiment that treating physicians should take out of this discussion that we're having today, that comprehensive and formalized risk assessment really takes the inconsistency out of the functional class as itself as a symptom of disease severity and that we should be using formalized risk assessment as another tool in our tool belt that really complements our clinical gestalt. So this has been a really great discussion. I thank you for joining us today as we reviewed one of the latest publications on the importance of formalized risk calculations and I thank my guest host, Dr. Sandeep Sahai, for this very important article and these very important points for our treating physicians. Dr. Benza, I'm glad to participate in that. And I hope this podcast will help our listeners learn more about the risk stratification and the gestalt based assessment. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. If you would like more information on risk assessment, PAH treatment guidelines, or to use an online risk calculator, please visit pahinitiative.com slash HCP.